in your hands, my fellow citizens, more than mine, will rest the final success or failure of our course. Since this country was founded, each generation of Americans has been summoned to give testimony to its national loyalty. The graves of young Americans who answered the call to service surround the globe. Now the trumpet summons us again, not as a call to bear arms, though arms we need, not as a call to battle, though in battle we are, but a call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle, year in and year out, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, a struggle against the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease, and war itself. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. All labor has dignity. Yes. But you are doing another thing. You are reminding not only Memphis, but you are reminding the nation that it is a crime for people to live in this rich nation and receive starvation wages. America's opportunity to help bridge the gulf between the haves and the have-nots. And the question is whether America will do it. There's nothing new about poverty. What is new is that we now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. And the real question is whether we have the will Thank you everyone for being here this evening and tuning in for our webcast uh, that we've titled Leadership in a Time of Crisis. And certainly those were inspiring words from two of America's finest leaders and gentlemen who made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. And uh, what we wanna talk about today is what we as citizen leaders in our communities can do to, um, to help move the National Infrastructure Bank along because it is so critical to the future of America, to rebuilding our country and providing that economic opportunity um, to every region, to every state. My name is Julie Olson. I'll be your moderator this evening. Uh, I'm a business person in the Pacific Northwest and a, the chair of the Alaska Democratic Party Progressive Caucus. We were very successful in introducing the resolution supporting the National Infrastructure Bank at our, um, our uh, 2021 State Central Committee meeting, and we're working on getting it introduced into the Alaska State Senate. And it's been uh, really an honor to be able to work with uh, this group of citizen leaders over the past several years on um, uh, moving forward the National Infrastructure Bank. So we have a, a excellent lineup of speakers this evening who will be sharing information uh, with all of us in terms of what they are doing in their individual areas and their ideas for what we can all do as leaders in our regions to move the National Infrastructure Bank forward. Uh, so uh, what we'll do is we'll be moving through our list of speakers. Uh, at the end, we'll have time for some question and answers. And then uh, we are actually gonna have a call to action at the end of this phone call. So uh, looking forward to hearing all of your ideas and, and sharing discussion in the question, questions and answers. So with that, we will go to our first speaker who is Senator Louis De Palma of Rhode Island. He has already apologized to everyone for not having his makeup on, but we are gonna forgive him for that and um, listen to his words. Uh, Senator De Palma. Uh, Julie, thank you very much. And I do apologize. I wasn't able to get my makeup done prior to the <laughs> call. I said to folks, I do have the face for radio. Unfortunately, <laughs> this has a camera. So uh, now I'll talk. 
great to be here. And I, as I say to folks, I always want to be associated with a group that doesn't take no for an answer. And this is clearly a group that doesn't take no for an answer. Uh, the two things I want to share tonight, and I just sent another text a second ago. Um, the first thing is reading, reaching out. We had a call last week and some planning how we might get this publicized across the country via singular means. And one of those means is radio, specifically national public radio. Uh, so through my uh, relationship locally, I was able to connect with somebody at the uh, national, national public radio in Washington, DC. I talked, in fact, that person today. Uh, I tried to make the case for why this is important. I think we'll hear back. So that's a means to <clears throat> help us get our message out uh, in a wider audience for folks who may not know about this and help get it over the goal line. The uh, second area is reaching out to our Secretary of Commerce at the uh, national level. In fact, there was a great article about her in the Washington Post. I think it was yesterday or the day before. Uh, I also texted her last night, uh, Secretary Gina Raimondo. She used to be our governor, Gina Raimondo, in Rhode Island, great person. Uh, she's number 10 in line for succession to be president. We hope that never has to happen, obviously. Well, she has a bright future. We previously met several of us with her staff. I just reached out to one of her staff folks who was one of her senior advisors while she was here in Rhode Island to hopefully have a call with him tomorrow to see how we can set up. She's extremely busy. I know how busy she is even when she was in Rhode Island, but to try and get on her radar screen again, uh, or on her radar screen, her office is better aware of this, but to touch base with them tomorrow, can't guarantee it'll happen. <clears throat> we have to be able to reach any and all folks who can get the message to higher levels of government about why this is important. So I'll be around for the duration and back to you, Julie. Thank you so much. We appreciate that update from Rhode Island. Uh, next, I would like to call on Representative Mary Jo Daly from Pennsylvania. She's been doing great work out there in terms of raising the visibility of the National Infrastructure Bank. Mary Jo, can you tell us the latest in Pennsylvania? Uh, thank you, Julie. Um, it's great to be with everyone tonight and uh, certainly stirring to um, listen to those two speeches. Uh, so in Pennsylvania, we are, there's a group of us, uh, you can see the list uh, in front of you. This, that's actually last session's uh, bit, uh, resolution, but we have it again this session and we've been encouraging all the people who signed onto it last session to um, get onto it again. Uh, the, the NIB coalition has been really tremendous in uh, holding meetings with individual state representatives, state senators and our congressional delegation. Um, and so I think we just need to continue doing that work. But I agree with Senator De Palma that, you know, getting the word out in a big way, uh, and I agree that national public radio is um, a good way to do it. And I actually think that we should all be contacting our local uh, NPR stations. I know we are in the process of contacting WHYY in the Philadelphia area. Because I think if they start hearing from a lot of folks who are interested in it, it becomes something real. I mean, infrastructure is the thing that everybody's talking about right now. And I think we, this is another avenue that I think is so important to actually, you know, fulfilling the promises of actually getting the infrastructure fixed. And, and when you talk about infrastructure, it's the kind of thing that everybody, everybody who drives or takes public transportation or, uh, doesn't have very good broadband or, you know, is concerned about water. These are all things that um, are, everybody can understand it because I think they're things that we all worry about. So I am looking forward to working with Lou De Palma on getting onto NPR or at least continuing that fight. But I do think that a larger strategy so that, so that we make sure that NPR is hearing it from their local areas as well as, um, uh, the national and you know the national group. I know the Philadelphia stations are on Sirius. I hear them when I'm riding in my car. So, you know, we have lots of avenues there. So I, I just um, always happy to be on one of the uh, NIB calls. I'm going to have to jump off uh, though after I speak. I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to stay for uh, all the presentations. But 
I'll tell you, these are these are great meetings and it's just a wonderful core group. And I feel like I'm getting to know a lot more people. So thank you for all getting on. Thank you, Julie. And uh, especially thank you to Stu because he makes those calls. He's very persistent and he's hard to resist, and, uh, but it gets the work done. Thank, thank you so much, Mary Jo. We appreciate it. Uh, next, we're going to move on to Alfeka Mutardi. Alfeka is the chief economist for our group and uh, a former senior economist for the International Monetary Fund. Uh, Alfeka? Thank you very much, Julie. Uh, um, it's so wonderful to be here again to see all of um, our wonderful supporters of the National Infrastructure Bank. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of a leadership uh, uh, call out and shout out um, uh, about our bill in Congress, HR 3339, and give you some updates as well. So if I could go to my first slide. Um, the, we're, we're here to talk about leadership among us, leadership that we need to move this bill forward, and also the leadership that the National Infrastructure Bank as an institution provides. Uh, it, uh, what we need uh, in order to get our infrastructure bill rebuilt our economy rebuilt, our workforce rebuilt. Uh, we need a long-term plan for infrastructure financing and the NIB provides that. Uh, our workers also need a boost and we need to have adequate financing to get this job done. So what the NIB provides is $5 trillion at a minimum to cover all of the shortfall that's measured for infrastructure financing. If we do nothing, our infrastructure costs will keep on rising from two to $7 billion a year. Our infrastructure will cover crumble. And I'm sure as Stephen is going to so graphically uh, picture in just a moment, we'll go into this death spiral of our economy, but there is a way out. Our federal budget has come up with a, an infrastructure uh, bill that was just uh, passed in November. It's only going to provide $550 billion of new money. That's one tenth too small. That scale of a, of a uh, bill is not uh, large enough to grow our economy. What we see is that our income inequality is still rising. Uh, our uh, stimulus is uh, not, not done. Uh, we need to work harder on uh, having uh, more equitable growth in our economy. We are now in a period of stagflation. That means high inflation. We've, we just this month registered a 7% inflation rate and our growth rate is slowing down, slowed down by COVID, slowed down by inflation, slowed by, down by coming out of stimulus spending. Uh, and we're losing our worldwide comp, uh, competition. Uh, in uh, China and uh, Europe and other places that have infrastructure banks are surging on ahead of us. This is what a permanent national infrastructure bank will do. It will supercharge the economy, grow it at 5% per year. It'll create up to 25 million new family sustaining jobs. And this will provide equitable growth because it's shooting its hose of financing money into the center of the real economy, not pushing it towards Wall Street speculation. It'll improve overall planning of our infrastructure rollout. We won't have any more silo uh, um, provision of money, which is mostly going to roads and expanding roads and, nothing, and not much else. Uh, that We need more transit and, and rail in our mix to improve uh, the environment and save on CO2 emissions from transportation. We need to stimulate uh, American manufacturing, which the bill will do through its Buy America Only provision. And we need to improve state and local finances so that they can take on loans and repay them back as well. So our National Infrastructure Bank needs your leadership. Uh, Congress is done, believe me. They have passed the infrastructure bill. Their Build Back Better has stalled. Uh, they're focused on uh, future elections. They're not doing well even with their uh, voting rights acts. Uh, they're done uh, with uh, infrastructure financing. If we don't come up with this uh, National Infrastructure Bank bill to top up all of our needs, uh, well, our, we won't succeed. And our state and local legislators and our local activists, our union folks, they all recognize what the problem is. So what we need are sponsors for HR 3339. So we ask all of you to galvanize, to go out there and keep pestering your members of Congress. They're, they've got blinders on and they need to really 
see you and see you often do it the New York way. Keep on calling them up and asking them to co-sponsor and pass HR 3339. And we need to focus on our problems. Um, I'm gonna talk about one problem in the next slide, which is uh, um, uh, our, our problem with uh, affordable housing for, uh, for everyone to live in. Uh, uh, the National Infrastructure Bank has $7.2 uh, um, billion, $720 billion in it just for building affordable housing. Uh, the current state of housing in America is, is deplorable, really. Uh, it's supposed to be handled by the U.S. Department, you know, Housing and Urban Affairs uh, Development, HUD, and Health and Human Services, HHS, but they have no money in the budget to take care of this. We have 2 million Americans that are homeless. That is, they're either living in shelters or, or outdoors. Uh, this includes veterans, uh, children. Half of the homeless live in California alone. Really, the California legislators need to pay attention to this. It's a very serious problem. We other also have high homelessness rates in Washington, Oregon, Alaska, Colorado, Texas, New York, Massachusetts, and Florida. Every one of those legislatures needs to pay attention to this. Uh, another problem is 10 to 15% of all American households are housing insecure. That means that they could be kicked out of their houses at any moment. They're only a paycheck away from being evicted. Uh, they have 40% of Americans don't have any savings. If they lose their job, they're, then they're evicted. This is really a, a ser seriously affecting uh, African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, people of color. Uh, two long-term factors that 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 uh, uh, influence uh, homelessness are low pay, and the National Infrastructure Bank will take care of that by um, putting uh, more money uh, in these 25 million jobs that it creates into people's pockets in the middle, and the high cost of housing, which is spurred on by a housing shortage, migration of people to cities, and of course, Fed policy that fuels the speculation in housing. Uh, the COVID pandemic has exacerbated everything. Uh, we have uh, the national uh, eviction moratorium has ended. We have uh, rental assistance money is running out. We have overcrowding in housing units and, we, and that's leading to deaths. Uh, just this last week, we had a, a, fire, uh, a fire in apartment housing in Bronx where smoke inhalation killed uh, 19 uh, people, including children. It's reminiscent of the, sh uh, the shirt tail fire in 1911 in a, in a New York um, uh, man, um, clothing manufacturing uh, that that, civ, uh, that sparked a lot of the reforms of the New Deal, and that we, this just shows that the problem hasn't gone away, and we haven't addressed it. But what will the National Infrastructure Bank do? It'll provide, as I said, 720 billion over 10 years to build seven more to, uh, affordable housing units, create 25 million new family sustaining jobs, reduce poverty. It includes the Clyburn 102030 rule, where we want to direct projects at areas that have lived for a long period of time in, in poverty. We have a trust fund for areas that can't afford to take loans. Uh, this, the, the bank itself pro provides the leadership and the full financing to complement all of the government's policies with regard to housing and poverty reduction. And we can do it. We can get our, our um, uh, Americans out of poverty and, uh, and into secure housing. So thank you very much. Appreciate it very much for your time. Thank you, Alfeca. Uh, really appreciate that. And certainly the focus on housing is very important. Uh, homelessness is an issue ar around the country. I believe every state in the union has that problem. And I, I do want to point out that the National Infrastructure Bank, by investing in broadband, that would be able to extend out to even the most rural parts of the country would enable uh, remote working, uh, uh, telemedicine, and distance learning. So those are three very important reasons why people leave rural America and come to the cities. And so certainly it's much more possible to build affordable housing out in the more rural areas. And so this is something that the National Infrastructure Bank um, would be able to address. Okay, so uh, next we are gonna go on to uh, the Midwest. Uh, it'll be very interesting to hear from Representative Alan Green, former representative from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, representative Green, can you uh, tell us how Missouri is viewing the need for infrastructure? 
All righty, let's talk about the state of Missouri, which is a fun state, which is a conservative state, okay? Uh, I just want to put on the table again, uh, I had the opportunity to talk to the minority leader on the Democratic side. Uh, we have a super majority here in the state of Missouri of 163 representatives. We only have basically about, I uh, say 46, roughly, uh, Democrats out of a house of uh, 163. But they're still uh, aggressive. And the speaker said, the, uh, I had the opportunity to talk to the speaker a little bit. There, of course, he's a Republican. He's probably not gonna be interested in this bill, but the minority leader is interested in uh, this resolution right here. Going back to the understanding of this, one of the things is I had an opportunity to serve seven years within the house, serve finance, economic development, workforce development and budget. And one of the big pieces that always came up was how are we going to fund our bridges and our roads? And so over the years, I had the opportunity to look at tow roads and how would that fund? Look at the gas tax, which eventually a couple of years ago, we did get passed here. Bonds and of course, public private partnerships and how we would fund some of these projects. MoDOT here in Missouri was running like 30 years behind on projects. I'll say that again. MoDOT here, was running 30 years behind on projects. And we were trying to figure out how we were going to fund the projects because there was a gap in there where we were looking at where would the money come from. With this infrastructure bank, there would never have to be a worry again. And all the things that I just said there, looking at again, tow roads, looking at gas tax, looking at again, public private partnerships, those were being very creative ways of how we could fund infrastructure. But on a national level, you can't put tow roads everywhere. You can't do it. We could hike up the gas rate, but who wants to do that? No one. You know, we could look at more and more public-private partnerships, which is also in Congress and Senate right now. But who really wants to do that? And who wants to put our infrastructure in private capital hands? No one wants to do that. So in looking at this infrastructure bank, it would be the perfect avenue that would help fund. And one of the things that I kept looking in the years of doing this particular model right here, I had never heard of it until I got involved with this coalition, which by again, being involved with something else, got me involved in this. I had never heard of the infrastructure bank. And that's amazing because I read a lot I've been involved in lots of different projects and I had never heard of this. And I've done lots of different research and trying to figure out how we're gonna fund some of these projects. And so again, I'm proud to be sitting here. Uh, again, we have a coalition coming up with, like I stated earlier, but I think I was on mute, the Missouri Minority Business Development Agency with the MBDA nationwide is going to do a meeting with Indiana, Illinois, MoDOT to talk about infrastructure, talk about those three states and how minorities are going to participate. And one of the big pieces why I sit here too is I do want to see more minority participation in all of these projects. In 2009, I was over the Office of Equal Opportunity for the state of Missouri under a governor, and we had a chance to work closely with the White House. And during that particular time, one of the things that I noticed is that during that stimulus of 2008, 2009, and it was only three years, most minorities didn't get the opportunity to actually participate in those projects because they were shovel ready. And that means again, you had to be ready to go soon as those contracts were let. And most minority companies were not. And so I sit here saying that all of those things from experiences of the past, I would like to see better in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's very interesting to hear from uh, someone from Missouri. I think uh, you might be um, uh, one of the first speakers I've heard fr from that state. So I'm sure we'll have some questions for you later on. And now uh, what we'd like to do is go to another um, a member of our coalition from the Midwest, and that would be Representative Catherine Ingram from Ohio. Catherine? First of all, let me apart, uh, apologize for my tardiness of getting on the call. Um, as a realtor, you may imagine that things are crazy right about now. And uh, as a listing agent, 
I've been bombarded. So I've got lots of things going on. But thank you very much for allowing me to be here today. And I, and I appreciate being able to listen to uh, what else is going on around the, 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 the country when we start to talk about the um, infrastructure bank and the urgency of trying to make sure that it works and works for all of us. And that um, we need to build everything in, in all of our communities. And when I got on, I heard the gentleman talking about the inclusion piece and shovel ready and all those other things is that the only way, and I, and I hear this all the time, especially in real estate, especially in uh, uh, what I see in our inner city core and the changes that are being made uh, in uh, housing, et cetera, is that there's a, you know, we need to make sure that people are ready to get this work and ready to uh, talk about uh, shovel ready and things of that nature in order to get the dollars. And we have to make sure that when this bank is in place, that it's structured in a way that it benefits everybody. I hear folks all the time saying, well, the better we make your, the core areas, the urban core areas, the better everybody is. All the rising tide floats all boats. And I tell them all the time, uh, not if some of the boats may have a hole or leak and then they don't get to float. They, they may even sink even further if indeed we make, don't make sure that those leaks and those uh, holes are plugged. So that's an important piece of where we are. Uh, it's very important for poor and minority communities to break the cycle of poverty and despair. And some of the ways to do that is with making sure that the infrastructure bank is um, is functioning properly. That it means that we are looking at how we are all impacted and how we can uh, ensure that there is not a continued disparity and making sure that all boats rise when the tide rises. And so um, I, I apologize, I don't have a lot prepared to say. I'm here listening actually. And uh, most of the folks who've talked to me already will say uh, I'm pretty to the point as to what I wanna see, uh, what I, I'm going to hold folks accountable for because part of what we need to make sure of all of us is that we hold ourselves accountable. And I know that that pot of dollars will be somewhere else, but I don't want to get it waylaid by uh, some of the stuff that I see in our areas already here in Ohio, we have jobs, Ohio, and it's a wonderful thing. We took our liquor license, which was our state license. It was uh, sold to a entity that entity still works with the state, uh, but they use the, the liquor sales and the taxes, et cetera, in order to do uh, uh, development here in the state of Ohio. The difference is, is that I've had to push them very hard on what does inclusion look like? Because technically, despite the fact that you consider yourself a private entity, those are still public dollars. And so I know that's a bit off track as to what we're here to talk about today, but my whole point is, is making sure we hold folks accountable for the outcomes that, uh, that we need. And I think that um, legislation and, and, uh, and Congress is important to make sure that they get that bill passed. And I know as the second vice president of the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus here, uh, we are looking at that closely and trying to make sure that we send something through to encourage that to get done as quickly as possible. All right, thank you, Representative uh, Ingram. Uh, certainly um, inclusion is extremely important and uh, we have some of those provisions written into the proposed legislation. Um, I also want to point out that after the legislation passes, it's still going to take a year plus in order to stand up this organization. And so there's plenty of opportunity in the future to have input. And we're gonna be looking to people like you to give us input in terms of uh, the organization and the management and the priorities that we lay out for the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, okay, now uh, what I'd like to do is go out to the, um, Pacific Northwest out to my neck of the woods. And we are going to go to 
Linda Tosti Lane, who is the former president of the Washington State National Organization of Women and is currently the secretary of the first legislative district Democrats. And she had a very exciting meeting with, um, uh, or a Senate hearing this morning, I believe. Uh, Linda, can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I can. Um, we have, uh, first of all, I want to start off that we've, we've, we've worked to get a number of, uh, on a wide range of support as we can through throughout the state for the infrastructure bank. Uh, we have the King County Democrats, the 1st District Democrats, the 34th District Democrats, Seattle Indivisible, all having uh, submitted resolutions uh, to their membership and then with copies of those on to Congress and also our state delegation uh, here in the state legislature. Senator Hasegawa and uh, four other senators um, uh, ha actually sponsored a bill which was heard this morning and it's a Senate Joint Memorial 8006 uh, which had a public hearing today uh, and there were 13 people who testified. All 13 spoke in favor of uh, this resolution including some of the people that are on here tonight, Senator Marilyn Chase, Alfeca Mortardi, Jack Hanna, Julie Olson, Stanley Forzik, Representative Alan Green, and others. Um, I also spoke, but I did not speak on behalf of the First District Democrats, which I am the secretary for. I actually spoke on behalf of Washington State Now, which is the National Organization for Women, and actually took a different point of view in speaking out and that what I pointed out was that how the transportation network uh, is uh, failing us and failing women and their families who may need public transportation to obtain health care or access to food and with those that not being in place uh, it needs you know we need some we need funding for uh, transportation and the infrastructure bank can help about help out with that. Um, so what I'm suggesting is is that we find the opportunities to speak out and speak up. No matter whether you're looking at uh, speaking to your legislator. In fact, one of the legislators uh, that is actually one of the sponsors of the bill. Um, I had tried to set up a meeting with him to speak with him, see if he could help with it. He never did set up the meeting, but he did take the information I sent him and decided it was a good bill to sign up for. Uh, so my uh, senator is actually one of the five sponsors of the bill. Also today, um, I had a, me a meeting with the retired public employees of Washington. I'm a, uh, I am retired two years ago from the state of Washington. Uh, and uh, we were meeting with the congressional staff of Murray, Cantwell, Larson, and Del Benny, uh, dealing with health care and pension programs, including Social Security. And so I took that opportunity uh, to ask for support for the National Infrastructure Bank, uh, tying in uh, how transportation affects health care, um, and asked where they stood. Uh, three of them said that they would get back to me and back to us um, with the information. Uh, but Representative Larson, staff member, said that he had signed on as a sponsor. That I didn't know. And even if you go look at the web national website, he does not list him as a sponsor. But at least I know now that my own congressperson, Representative Larson, so what I'm suggesting is that we need to take every opportunity we can to speak up, speak out, and get support across the broad range of organizations we belong to, we participate in, and with our legislators and our Congress people. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Linda. Really appreciate that report. And I, I think it's extremely important to um, that we reach out to other constituencies. Um, so for example, you're representing um, now at the, uh, the Senate hearing. And so certainly making sure we have a broad base of support is extremely important in terms of moving this forward.
Uh, okay, so uh, next what we're going to do is go to uh, the other side of the country with Lou Spencer, who is the Vice President of the Virginia State Building and Construction Trades Council. And uh, I am curious, Mr. Spencer, uh, your constituency, are they pretty well divided between uh, Republicans and Democrats, or what do you see there in terms of uh, your group? Yes, I think generally... Um... The people in this area are like the rest of the country. <clears throat> uh, and that's where this National Infrastructure Bank works very, very well. It will pull the country together. Uh, what you see on your screen there is a resolution that was adopted by the Virginia AFL-CIO um, probably a little over a year ago, maybe two years. And um, recently, last summer, my international union, the United Association of Plumbers and Steam Fitters, Sprinkler Fitters and HVAC Technicians, we had a summer convention and my local union, Plumbers Local 5, submitted a resolution to that convention. It was submitted and it was approved by the uh, Committee on Resolutions and passed unanimously. I think we had close to 3,400 delegates in attendance. Uh, there wasn't any opposition. So the United Association of Plumbers and Steamfitters supports the National Infrastructure Bank. And um, I live in Essex County, Virginia, a very conservative, very rural county. And um, the county has been trying to start a marina. It's been trying to improve a wharf in the town of Tappahannock. Um, some areas of the county have broadband, some areas don't. Um, it's not a wealthy county, that's for sure. The Board of Supervisors, very conservative. We debated the National Infrastructure Bank for three months. I wrote the resolution. I submitted the resolution. They entertained the resolution. And in December, they did approve the resolution. So uh, on one hand, we have a large trade union like the United Association that passes a resolution in support of the National Infrastructure Bank. And then on the other end of the spectrum, a small rural county in Virginia, mostly farming, mostly agriculture, um, logging um a very conservative board of supervisors and they also adopted the uh, national infrastructure bank uh, a resolution supporting the same i was um stuck in traffic on interstate 95 during the snowstorm uh, i was in traffic for 20 hours i sat in one spot for 17 hours and i had no cell phone service my family couldn't reach me the only reason i was traveling 95 was to get to fredericksburg the power was out, my daughter's house, she had no uh, heat or power. But um, we're definitely way behind. We're not competitive. Um, other nations are friendly nations and adversarial nations are surpassing us in infrastructure. We need to get this done. And this is a great way to pull people together and um, get our country back on track. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your comments. Really appreciate that. I'm um, sure we'll have some questions for you in the Q&A. Um, okay, I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to uh, go to Assemblyman Felix Ortiz, the former Assistant Speaker of the New York Assembly. Assemblyman Ortiz, are you on the, the line? Yes, I'm here. Hello, Felix. Hi to see you all. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity. And also, I would like to uh, really thank uh, the folks of uh, Washington State for putting this event together today and having this uh, resolution uh, on their agenda. I think that every one of us that participated uh, really uh, uh, was extraordinarily outstanding to uh, put the pressure, not just only to Washington State, but to also use this opportunity as a model uh, to replicate it through different states whichever state uh, we might be able to have such kind of uh, hearings that can take place where uh, members uh, of the legislature may be able to entertain uh, a similar uh, forum. Uh, I think this uh, this uh, indicating that, uh, that it is very critical when you have, for example, uh, uh, individual from different state, you know, was about 13 or 15 people that sign off, 13 people that participated and across the border from different state and, and mainly from the state of uh, uh, Washington state. So that's uh, 
that is a big support to the senator. And uh, as a former elected official who always uh, had it, the opportunity to do legislations that was a little controversial, if you will, uh, but also finding unified people around the country and having what we will be discussing tonight, uh, a day of action about my bill, uh, you know, not related to this conversation, but uh, when I was doing a bill banning cell phone from driving and testing test messaging, you know, the state of the Seattle, Washington state was one of the first state to uh, unite with me and, and trying to make a press conference back in 2000. Uh, and we did 20 state at the same time. So this is the kind of actions that I do believe is helpful, uh, not just to uh, bring the attention to the media uh, on the issue that we are or have a common goal denominator and supporting at this point. I would like to add a couple of things because uh, you know I'm Ali and agree with Alberta and Anna, and I think Alan Green and uh, as well as Catherine uh, brought something very critical and very important. And I and I would yet would like to echo and their their uh, sentiment sentiments uh, as well as a minority myself. Uh, and I think it's very important not to wait until things get done. Uh, as we are moving forward, I think it should be a team also working on how, what kind of, what kind of procedures of, uh, can we develop in the meantime, when this happens, we don't have to wait to train or to bring people into the picture. Uh, when, uh, when, when, <laughs> you know, when uh, I'll give you a quick example, we did the M MWBA, B a B a minority business woman, enterprise here in, in New York state. I was one of the co prime of that piece of legislation. So one of the major uh, fundamental aspects of that bill was not to approve the bill, was to make sure that we approve a bill with teeth, with, with, where we have money allocated to retrain and to educate and to give orientation to minority entrepreneurs and minority contractors and minority business people who believe it or not, they've been around for hundred years but you know, they don't understand how to apply for contract and how to apply for services into the government. For example, the private sector, forget about it. That's another story. So if we have the mechanism or we can create a mechanism with some of the experts to uh, say, okay, you know, this is what is might gonna happen and it's gonna happen when it's happened. So, but at the same token, we will be able to help uh, uh, develop a, a, a kind of training session or a program to help minority, uh, minority contractor. I also would like to, uh, to uh, emphasize on Senator Parma's points of, uh, regarding, uh, yes, it's very important to reach out to the NPR, but as we all know, uh, we all know that is three important mechanisms that work very well in social media. It's called Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and whatever else is out there. So I think every single one of us, uh, as we having this conversation today, you know, should take a picture and Twitter that picture with, Today, we joined with so many people throughout the country to address, boom, the national infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. And I, uh, and I, you know, I do that in every section that we have, in every session. And then you tag, you tag number one, the US Senate, you tag the Congress, you tag whatever houses of representatives you want to tag, and uh, you tag the media. I sent an example today to Stuart of what, what I do after uh, we finish the session. I tag the New York Times, the Daily News, the New York Post, the U.S. today, and uh, and this also, these people at some point are going to say, "Who the hell are these people?" We need to figure out who are they, because in re in reality is, and I'm you know I I'm a media I, I love the media believe me when I was elected if you Google me I have thousands of of of, uh, of, of press releases attached to the media, but the issue the issue here and I said this before we don't have a lobbyist we don't have uh, that that cartel if you will to go to Washington and, 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 and be on the hall to be seen. Uh, but if we, every single one of us take, them, take, take that as a suggestion, we can have many, many tweeters out there tagging many, many, many different, different, different people. Um, I also would like to say that uh, we have to find now a common, a common, a common uh, denominator, a common uh, issue. Uh, Alberta mentioned, and I also been using that uh, affordable housing, affordable housing. What is affordable? What is low income? What is affordable house? National infrastructure will help with affordable housing. Now every single one of us might have 
a, a, a very different issue that is critical for us, broadband, for example, so whatever. But whatever that issue is, we need to make sure that we be able to, to identify an issue that the press will be able to say, wait a minute, the national infrastructure, guess what? We'll be able to do A, B, C, D. By the way, that was, this is the class that I, that I taught this morning. <laughs> it was about how to, how to deal with the media. Uh, and the and the and the bottom line here is how can we how should we all deal with the media? I know we all busy, we all have different stuff to do, uh, and but at the same token, just a little Twitter, just a little Twitter, just a little Facebook, hashtag, your newspapers, local newspaper, the the caucuses and so on and so forth. That will go a long way. And finally, finally, finally. We have to we have to make sure if we do that those tag uh, or, or whatever they call those uh, hack tag. Uh, I think uh, NCSL, CSG, National Hispanic Caucus, Black Caucus, caucuses in every single level. They need to know that we're meeting. No, you know nobody knows that we are meeting unless uh, unless we send an email. Uh, uh, Alan Alan was talking about. I was a member. I had no idea about this. Well, I was blessed. I was a member. Uh, four years ago, a, a steward who called me more than anything else, uh, he uh, he reached out to me four years ago. I did a resolution, never passed in New York, but guess what? We developed a lot of momentum on the media, make a belief that was happening. But it's a, everything is about make a belief, it's perception. Um, the fact that uh, the fact that Washington just closed uh, with something that doesn't mean anything because the media would not pay attention to other than what do national infrastructure is doing differently than the Biden bill that just passed in, in both houses? And Congress, everybody's running for office, everybody is, is, uh, is busy. And, uh, and Rebecca, you're absolutely right. Nobody's paying attention in Washington about what the hell is going to happen except about my reelection. Now it's about my reelection. It's about my reelection. You can call me 300 times, and I would love you to continue to call me. I will send you a text message. Tomorrow is my fundraising. When can you come? And they forget about the national infrastructure banking. Okay, so let's be realistic. I was elected. Let's be realistic. We need to be realistic. I cannot work with a group that cannot be realistic. We need to be realistic, and we need to be persistent. But we need to identify a couple of issues. But we need to take advantage of the social media. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me to be part of your family. Thank you. Thanks for those comments, Felix. As the takeaway, I'm gonna urge everybody, uh, as soon as the meeting is over, to uh, put a comment uh, on your own Twitter feed, on your Facebook, and let's start practicing our social media skills. It's a great way to uh, continue to raise our visibility. And um, um, okay, so now we're gonna go back to uh, Senator Tallman, who I believe uh, is there in person. So Senator Tallman, can you share with us what's happening in New Mexico? Well, what's happening in New Mexico, it's not much is happening in the big picture, but as far as the NIB, um, we, um, I was invited to uh, make a presentation to the Washington State Senate this morning, but I was having computer problems. I couldn't get on, but I understand they had 12 or 14 people in speaking in favor of it. Um, Earlier this week, I pre-filed, uh, um, we call them memorials, some states call them uh, resolutions to urge Congress to, of course, uh, enact uh, House Bill 3339. Uh, in the last couple of months, we've met with, we only have five people in our congressional um, delegation. We've had Zoom meetings with three of them, and uh, we're in the process of getting uh, a fourth one uh, later this month. Um, and um, we continue to, uh, to um, lobby uh, these people. And I've, um, we've um, had two uh, op-eds published in the largest newspaper in the state of New Mexico. And I made a short presentation at the CG Council of State Governments uh, West Conference in Colorado Springs in late September. And um, I've probably been on at least a dozen or more uh, Zoom meetings uh, similar to this one, although earlier, 
early on, we were kind of were doing a sales job on NIB, but recently we're doing a update. So we're, uh, we're uh, that's pretty much it on, um, on the um, New Mexico scene. One interesting development is we are recently, we had our state engineer resign for lack of resources. He claimed that we needed $2 wow. billion for infrastructure. And we only got one six of that, 350 million in the infrastructure bill. So some of these, our local delegation, you would hear them talk, you would think we'd died and gone to heaven uh, with this infrastructure bill, but it's uh, falls, falling, as we all know, far short of what we need. Another example of, of the shortfall is we need one and a half billion dollars so that the 25% of our population that don't have access to broadband can get it. And we're only getting a hundred million or less than 10% of what we really need. Although in fairness, there are other, there are other uh, federal grants we can get, but it's still gonna leave a gap of a half a billion dollars, getting no money for uh, high-speed rail and no money for upgrade the electric grid. We are fast approaching the point where we will not be able to trans any more electricity because of our lack of capacity on electric grid. We have the second sunniest state and one of the top five windiest, so we have a lot of potential, but we don't have the electric grid. So that's uh, it. That's it for now. And if you take any questions, thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Senator Tallman. We appreciate all your uh, work on the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, I'd just like to uh, share something from my home state of Alaska, which is the most commonly shared photographs over the last couple of days are the grocery store shelves where many of them are empty because we have not been able to get ships in from uh, the port of Seattle to bring in groceries. And so we see these, um, these impacts to our, uh, to our society, to our ability to get food, to have electricity all across the country. Um, anyway, I'd like to go to um, another person from New Mexico that would be Ray Ellen Smith. She is the president of Albuquerque Indivisible. Ray Ellen. Hello, good evening, everybody. Um, I know this is my first meeting like this. Um, uh, I learned about this in detail on uh, December 30th and I couldn't be more excited. Um, I, uh, I just have a question. Somebody can text me later the answer, but why didn't Alexander Hamilton think of this in the first place? So I'm gonna lay this all on his doorstep uh, but we have a chance to fix it. So Stu invited me to, Stuart invited me to join tonight to um, tell you a few things um, about what I love, but let me introduce myself. Um, Ray Ellen Smith, president of Indivisible Albuquerque. We're the largest indivisible group in the state of New Mexico. We have 200 members that actually pay dues to, um, to work with us. Um, we do a lot of really great things on the national, state, and local levels. And um, I had a, had a fabulous conversation this week or last week with Senator Tallman, for which I'm very grateful. Um, some of the things that I love about what I heard and what I read after speaking with Stu and Alfeca and others um, was just the boldness of this amazing idea. Um, I, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. I'd never heard of such a thing and it would completely transform basically the way our government works and uh, solves so many problems in one fell swoop. I love the bipartisan nature of it. I think this could really um, go a long way to um, serve to help bridge a lot of the gaps and pull the country back together because everybody benefits and it doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on. Um, it, it solves that perennial folk funding problem um, it's, it's so well studied, studied, and, uh, it seems like all the kinks are pretty well worked out in concept. I know the devil is always in the details. Um, but this, this just sounds fa fabulous. So, um, in my career as a, uh, CPA at PricewaterhouseCoopers, where I worked for 30 years, I, I learned a lot of things about devil in the details and, uh, I'm ready to get to work on this. So some of the things that I've done, um, in the last two weeks. Uh, I have brought this up to my Indivisible Group board. Um, we've invited uh, some members of the team here to speak at a meeting. I don't think we've landed the date yet, but we're working on that. We certainly want Alfeca to um, uh, come give her pitch. Uh, we, we have 
monthly meetings with all the members of our federal delegation, well, except one, so four of the five. And um, we're, we've already got this on the list to start uh, questioning them about. We meet with them monthly, and this is on that list of, of items to start talking about. And this group that meets monthly is representative of almost all the, there's one representative from almost all the indivisible groups in the state of New Mexico that meet with our members of Congress monthly. Um, the, the other thing that we've been doing is we are planning a statewide indivisible conference to, to occur in April, uh, late April, April 30th to be exact. And, um, you know, COVID considering uh, whatever that looks like, um, but we do want to have um, a panel discussion about this. And uh, Senator Tallman, I think I mentioned this, but we'll definitely want to want want you to participate in that in um, in late April on April 30th. And that would bring together over 200 uh, to 250 indivisible members from all around the state of New Mexico at one time in one conference. And we'd love to have this as a panel item. And um, I guess you know before I close, I just want to you know, ask one thing, and that is how, how do we keep this to only infrastructure? It just seems like the solution to a whole lot of things. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. I'll be back. Thank you, Ray Ellen. Uh, that seems like quite an accomplishment to get that regular monthly meeting scheduled with your members of Congress. So we might want to get some tips on just exactly how you manage to arrange that. Um, okay, and then finally, we're going to go to Jack Hanna. He's the former interim chair of the uh, Pennsylvania Democratic uh, Party, and he has relocated out to the West Coast, where he now lives in Oregon. Jack? Uh, thank you, Julie. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to take a bit of a different approach in talking about our topic tonight and ask this question. Why are we here tonight? It is a rhetorical question, but only somewhat. Of course, we're here to support and promote the creation of a national infrastructure bank, but it's more than that that's bringing us together. It's also about deep concern for our families, our local communities, and for our country. We all care and fear for it, and we're all right now looking for a direction, a vision, of defining where we are and where we should go. In the past, our country's great leaders provided us with that vision and direction that's made America great. Our founding fathers, including Alexander Hamilton and thereafter Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, John F. Kennedy, and Martin Luther King Jr. all talked about and inspired for our country, the goals and rights of social and economic justice, freedom, and establishing the mechanics of government to accomplish those goals. The bank does that. Although not wanting to belabor that point, I do wish to offer some additional quotes from Martin Luther King Jr. and JFK to exemplify what I'm talking about. Martin Luther King Jr has these two quotes. 10,000 fools proclaim themselves into obscurity, but one wise man forgets himself into immortality. The second quote, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. These are words that have been spoken by the very best of our leaders that unify our country's definition, vision, and essence. Our country is now at a very unique and fraught moment. Having been a child of the 50s and 60s, I can't remember another moment as divisive and dangerous for our country, even compared to then. However, you all and I have come to support the creation of a national infrastructure bank, not because of our generation, not because of personal gain or ambition, not because of partisan political purposes, but because I suggest we see it as a common benefit, need, 
and part of a vision that can unify our country, make it economically strong and equitable. And that's because of the bank's unfailing success at the founding of our country to get it out of debt uh, after the Revolutionary War in uniting it uh, with a transcontinental railroad uh, uh, promoted by Abraham Lincoln. And last but not least, saving our country from the Great Depression, along with preparing ourselves for World War II. Our bank, and I call it our bank because it's based upon what's called the American system of banking, not the British's, was, can be, and will be, again, uh, the idea that unites our country to follow the vision that it was founded upon and send us in a direction that all know, uh, we all know is for our common good. So just as F, uh, uh, excuse me, just as JFK called upon us in his inauguration in 1961 to ask not what our country can do for you, we are calling on our elected officials, local, state, and federal to join us in a call for action to create a national infrastructure bank. We cannot let this opportunity uh, to get our country back on track go by the wayside. We must press them and our fellow citizens to join us to recreate the same vision our great leaders have had before so we may have it inspire us again as we go forth into the 21st century and face the local, national, and international economic challenges that we confront. If we wish to remain and continue as a great nation, we must have the economic wherewithal and the infrastructure it needs to succeed. And that, my friends, is why we are here tonight and why we are obligated to support a national infrastructure bank. Let us proceed with employing all our efforts and ideals in our call to action to the entire country to join us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack, for that uh, great summary. And now what I'd like to do is open it up for questions and answers. So you can uh, raise your hand if you have a question or you can put your questions in the chat. So it looks like we have a couple people with their hands up. So we'll go, uh, Doris, you had your hand up and then you took it down. Um, well, uh, I was actually just trying to give a, a, a little applause to Jack for the summary, oh. but I just think that this is a very good uh, reminder. And also, I just want to think if we should have a, have on your website the names of the people who have uh, already signed on, the representatives who are supporting this bill. Okay, I think that is on our website, but uh, we'll take a note. Um, and Stu and Angela, maybe you can address that. And uh, Alfeca, you've got your hand up. Uh, the sponsors on our bill, just to answer your question, and uh, another one is related to it too. Uh, the sponsors on HR 3339 so far are Bobby Rush and Huey Garcia from Illinois and Mondaire Jones from New York. And of course, uh, uh, Congressman Danny Davis has introduced the bill. So those are the four. Now, uh, I did want to point out to Linda Toasty Lane that uh, your Congressman Larson uh, is not a sponsor of HR 3339. He's a sponsor of another bill that was put in by Rosa Delora for a much smaller infrastructure bank. And so one of the things I would advise is that whenever you go to your members of Congress, uh, have all your guns and questions and information preloaded in your gun, okay? <laughs> because uh, they will try and weasel out as, as much as they can. Uh, and this is maybe an example of it. Um, the, the Rosa Delora bill has been introduced in Congress for the last 17 or 18 years. Uh, it's way too small to build infrastructure. It's only about, it'll only finance about 500 billion. So you can see again, it's one tenth too small to do the whole job. There's no point in passing an infrastructure bill that doesn't build everything. There's just no point. Another difficulty with that bill 
is it requires public-private partnerships, and we know that those are really a bad deal for most infrastructure. They will only cover one to 3% of infrastructure. And finally, uh, the, the, that bill also requires a provision from the budget. And that's what's holding back all of the other bill, uh, National Infrastructure Bank bill proposals that they require money from the budget. And we haven't been able to finance infrastructure, let alone to, to finance a bank. Uh, and our proposal is so unique because we go to the private sector to get infusions into the bank, to capitalize it, get it started. So there's no recourse to the national budget. Uh, it's budget neutral, no new taxes are needed, no new deficit spending is required. Uh, the, and the private investors are silent partners. Uh, they don't have any voting rights uh, in, the, in, the, in the bank. The provisions for the different kinds of projects are set out in the bill itself. Um, mostly we're covering, covering infrastructure, uh, but I did want to say that the one thing that we're not really covering with our bank is building electric generators because they are coming online through the public, through the private sector now. And a little bit of news in that line for Senator Tallman is that uh, a private entity is now investing in new windmill technologies in New Mexico, uh, and building and investing up of, at present $2 billion worth of transmission lines to move the energy and eventually we'll, we'll invest up to $6 billion. So this just shows that the private sector can uh, enter into these projects when it's uh, a, a benefit for them and they can see you know, a clear profit motive, but we'll need the National Infrastructure Bank to do most of the heavy living for living lifting for public infrastructure uh, because that is a public need and uh, uh, they can't necessarily make a profit from it. But overall, all of the public benefits from this very important public good. Thanks very much. Uh, okay, uh, Teresa Allen, I see you have your hand up. Did you have a question or a comment? For those who are new on the call and maybe missed uh, Stephen Hubbard's presentation, I believe it was in November about the importance of our infrastructure bank. And especially as we talk about clean energy, uh, one thing that has to be addressed for both commercial and residential development, as well as vehicles and that kind of thing is upgrading energy grids by state, by region, by city, because you can't move commercial buildings. You can't move a city's bus fleets et cetera, et cetera, to uh, electric if they don't have the capacity to charge them. And those are things that need to be considered as we develop um, things in the infrastructure bill like broadband and those kind of issues. But for energy and clean energy, it may be a step-by-step -step process, but we can't get ahead of ourselves either. Uh, as we pursue this. So that's one thing as we talk to our legislators at the state and federal level, we need to remind them that we need to improve some of those things to even move toward electric vehicles, to even move toward retrofitting uh, commercial and residential buildings and those kinds of things. So um, I just wanted to remind people of, of that who may be new on the call or who missed his wonderful presentation because it made me think, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. You can't move forward with a lot of uh, some of these green initiatives until we address the energy grids. So um, I just wanted to point that out. So thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Um, Dr. Hubbard had an emergency and was not able to be here uh, today, but he will be on future calls. And I totally agree with you that he presents some very valuable information. Uh, and what part of the country are you from? Uh, Northwest Ohio. Oh, okay. Wonderful. Glad to have I'm you. The, today. I'm the chair chairperson of All Aboard Ohio, promoting passenger rail mass oh. transit in our state. Thank wonderful. you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Great to, uh, to have you here. Yeah. If, I, if I may just because she's from uh, North, is, did you say Northwest Ohio? Yes, Ohio I am. period, it doesn't matter what part. And, and I am the state representative in, the, in uh, the 32nd district here in Ohio also. I didn't hear uh, uh, Mr. Hubbard's presentation, but I've said this for years. And, and in Ohio, we did have a 
an energy, a comprehensive energy bill a few years ago. And of course they put it on the shelf. But I want folks to understand that all of this stuff, it's not an either or. You have to have a comprehensive energy plan that looks at what's there now. How do you transition out of that? You know, a lot of people say, well, we're, we're coal fired and you've got the nuclear plants and all that other stuff. You don't just turn a grid off and turn uh, go flip a switch and turn one on somewhere else. So doing this comprehensively is so very important that we look at where we're moving to what those needs will be as far as energy uh, is concerned and how does that look on a comprehensive basis when in Ohio, uh, you know, it's not a time where, you know, in Virginia we were fighting over coal miners and things of that nature, but there has to be a way to transition out. Now we've got our issues in Ohio, definitely, and all over the country in, in, in various, uh, uh, with various issues regarding our energy energy supply, whether it's renewable, et cetera. But I wanted to make sure that with that plan, and I'd love to hear his presentation because there is no switch. There has to be a transition. You cannot say that right now, if you're getting 2% of your uh, source, your electricity from uh, renewables, you've got to figure out how you're going to supply everybody else who already exists, unless you're and then that means it has to be a comprehensive plan. And, and I'm not saying go get the one that, that Kasich did, our former governor did a few years ago, but I am saying that that's the only way we're gonna do this even in, in uh, all over the country. And the infrastructure bank will allow us to help do that, but it has to be done. Uh, there has to be a strategy. It has to be a comprehensive undertaking of understanding what we have and what we need and moving toward that. So I appreciate your comments. But I would like to, to <clears throat> offer up that I am sure that we can do a presentation for Ohio and get Dr. Hubbard involved. And we would love to address that specifically for Ohio. So um, we can follow up with Teresa and Catherine um, next week perhaps and uh, see if there's some interest in getting a, a specific Ohio uh, meeting rolling. Um, then I'd like to uh, go to the comments. Uh, Doris uh, in the chat had said that she wished there could be a public-private partnership between an automaker and the AARP to develop a generic, reliable, affordable electric car that could be mass marketed for people who want to drive electric but don't imagine themselves affording an electric car. So I'd just like to throw out a little anecdote. I, I just spent a week on Maui and on Maui, they're actually allowing people to drive electric golf carts on the roads. And uh, which I thought was great. They don't have that many roads there. And um, they've got wind, wind turbines now to generate electricity. And so you can imagine how, how expensive it is to buy gasoline where it all has to be imported um, into, into a place like Hawaii. So certainly there are regulations that local communities can pursue that would give us more flexibility in the types of electric vehicles that are allowed on roads. Uh, at any rate, uh, let's go with uh, Ruth Fruland uh, from Seattle, Washington. Ruth, do you have a question or a comment? Uh, yes, uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, um, reinforce what Felix Ortiz suggested about every state having, uh, taking, you know, this is a good time for every state to start uh, uh, putting in legislation for a public bank, uh, like an infrastructure bank, uh, like it's being done here in Washington state. But it also has to be carefully done because right now the legislation is creating a cooperative uh, and they won't even allow it to be called a bank. And I don't, I believe it's, it's kind of a goofy setup. So the legislation right now, I'm, I'm pretty doubtful that it will get us what we want without major revisions to it. Uh, secondly, I definitely agree with uh, Representative Ingram that we need a plan. And the only closest thing to a plan I've ever heard anyone say is, oh, well, we're gonna use natural gas. That's our in-between, you know? And it's like, that's not a plan. So I think we could be much more assertive in asking people what their plans are beyond just, oh, well, we're gonna use these stopgap measures. And then finally, I'd like to ask that we get uh, uh, a, 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 like a speaker talking about that uh, energy uh, situation like you said Hubbard would do for Washington State because I feel like we are finally 
maybe getting enough attention and it helped a lot with this morning's uh, session. So that's all, thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth, for those comments. Um, please, if you have any comments or questions, uh, put them in the chat. And in the meantime, I would like to um, ask Lou Spencer um, if the division between Democrats and Republicans came up in his discussions. We've heard a lot of other comments where people have said, oh, all of the sponsors are Democrats for our bills. We had uh, Representative Green who said that you have, what, 30% of the representatives there in Missouri are Democrats and the rest are Republicans. But how, how can we reach out to bridge that divide and to uh, make sure that the benefits of a national infrastructure bank um, are, are known to be bipartisan and that these projects would benefit everyone? Um, Lou, do you have any comments on that? Well, it's interesting you ask. Um, I'm a pretty conservative individual myself. And as a trade unionist, uh, I'm affiliated with the Northern Virginia Labor Federation. Uh, the Northern Virginia Labor Federation actually created a thing called the Republican Labor Committee. We wanted to get more of our Republican Union members involved in um, political action. And uh, the Northern Virginia Labor Federation created this Republican Labor Committee and asked me to spearhead this thing. I've reached out to Republicans. I've reached out to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, people that you would not normally see a, a business agent like myself um, allying with. But uh, the idea was that infrastructure is like the first thing on the agenda. If we can find common ground on infrastructure, we can work together on a whole host of other issues. Mm -hmm. So me personally, I'm, in, I'm heavily involved in outreach to, uh, to Republicans um, and Democrats. While we were on this call, I wrote to three of the top leaders at Virginia Department of Transportation, asking them to review the resolution that Essex County, Virginia adopted. And I hope to get some feedback from VDOT, uh, hopefully sometime tomorrow. It's all the above. It has to be comprehensive, as we said earlier. It has to be all the above. And like I said, this is something that can really bring this country together. Are, are there some buzzwords that um, members of this group should be using when they, they are talking to, you know, people who are supposedly more conservative? Should we be talking about pro-development or how, how would you suggest that the conversation be framed? Well, certainly this will, um, this will create economic growth. It'll bring back manufacturing. Uh, we want to move goods quicker, more efficiently across the country, either by rail or highway or airports, waterways, um, broadband, uh, just having communities being connected, I think is a big part. Water treatment, wastewater treatment projects, um, strengthening the power grid, everything that everyday Americans use and roads that we drive on, the bridges we cross. Uh, again, this is all really truly about the common good. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, Teresa, you've got your hand up again. Yes, uh, you wanted feedback on how to approach this in a comprehensive manner across the aisle. Yes. Uh, I've held public office for eight years in conservative rural Ohio and, and uh, as the first female township trustee and was well versed on economic development. But things, keywords here are jobs, improving the tax base uh, because people that are earning more money will pay more taxes, federal, state, local, and school taxes. Uh, it will help existing businesses. Uh, it will help our citizens regardless of their zip code uh, and so forth. So as uh, Mr. Spencer said, those common ground issues need to be stressed across the aisle to garner that support we want, especially like in Ohio with Republicans having um, a super majority at our General Assembly uh, where they override the governor at will. And so these are real important issues, common ground, economic development, tax base, jobs, and, and so forth. And for the good of our citizens, for the good of our existing businesses, businesses, attracting new people to Ohio, attracting new businesses. Those are common things that we all can use in our area of the country, I'm certain, to uh, uh, cross those political divides. 
So uh, those are my suggestions. Thank, thank you. Those are some great comments, great ideas. Um, I'd like to go with uh, Marilyn. Can I add? Oh, never mind. Go ahead. I, I just uh, want to add to that since we're you're still in Ohio. Sure. Okay. I, I think that the whole point is the whole we're talking about uh, the, the comprehensive and making sure that it is comprehensive. Uh, our Republicans, my colleagues at the State House, uh, what they get scored on from the Ohio Chamber of Commerce to the National Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, is in regard to businesses faring well. And what, what we are looking at right now, the benefit for all of us would be improving our national and our global comp competition, our competitiveness. Until we do that, and infrastructure will allow us to do that. It'll take care of businesses as well as making sure as uh, uh, was indicated about jobs and all of those other things. If businesses are gonna buy in, they need to make sure that it allows them to be uh, competitive. There are no free rides and nobody wants to make, everybody wants to make sure that nobody gets to take one. And so, um, my uh, colleagues at the State House, my Republican colleagues, despite the fact that they're a super majority, they're working hard to make sure that businesses are taken care of. And if we can take care uh, of making sure they understand that without competition, that Ohio right. and every other state continues to lose people if we don't do something on a national and as well as a global level. So sorry right. about interrupting. Great. No, fine. That's very important. Uh, okay, I'd like to call on Marilyn Chase uh, from Washington State. Marilyn? Thank you very much. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, conversation. I might suggest that each state in the Union benefited in the 1930s from FDR's um, uh, work on, uh, you know, whether it was the Public Works Administration or the Works Projects. Uh, or whether it was the CCC, and that uh, it, you know the the Republicans are just thrilled, at least here in Washington, um, when you point out what happened in their own district, thanks to the infrastructure bank in the 30s, and you just take a look and say, okay, what what really was built in each community in your state, uh, and use that as an example. They love it because there is absolute proof that this works for business as well as labor. Right, thank you. Um, okay, it is uh, nearly um, the, uh, uh, we've been into this for about an hour and a half now. And so what I'd like to do is um, uh, move on to some closing slides and comments. And um, so I do want to point out that uh, the coalition has been doing a lot of work in terms of advertising. Now, we haven't gotten on the radio yet, as was suggested by um, Senator De Palma. We're going to have to get some lessons from him on how to do it. But we have been really pretty successful in getting op-eds printed and articles. So uh, this is uh, one of our latest, and this is from the uh, New Scranton Times Tribune. And of course, Scranton, Pennsylvania is uh, kind of the old stomping grounds of our president, Joe Biden. So a uh, very favorable article that came out in the Times Tribune. And then we've had um, some really favorable um, uh, actions that have taken here a uh, place already in January. So we have the uh, National Black Caucus of State Legislators. This represents about 700 plus or minus Black legislators across the country have come out in support of the National Infrastructure Bank. So uh, we really appreciate this uh, nation, national group supporting us. Um, we also uh, have a resolution from the Council of State Governments. And um, so this is just a little article that talks about that. And then we also have just recently had resolutions uh, submitted into the Washington State Senate, we heard about that today, and also the Florida State Senate. So we've been making a lot of progress uh, around the country, um, both coasts, the Midwest, in terms of raising the visibility of the National Infrastructure Bank. Now, uh, we are uh, planning some additional items here in January. So we are 
planning a day of action for January 27th. And I had thought that perhaps Assemblyman Ortiz was gonna mention this uh, quickly, or um, does someone wanna give a, a quick rundown on what we have planned for January 27th? Um, I'm not, uh, rep or, uh, Assemblyman Ortiz, were you able to address this? Yes, um, what, I, uh, what I believe is that uh, we should um, uh, unify every single state that has uh, introduced a resolution and every single one of those uh, supporting the resolution, whether they are groups, associations, whether they are legislators in their respective houses, uh, that, uh, that we be able to hold a, like a, a press conference to make a press statement around the country uh, to, to, to show that is unity uh, within the 50th state and the territory. Uh, and that will, will send a clear signal uh, to the members of Congress and, the, and, and call them to, uh, to act on this particular HR 3339. So that's, uh, that's what my uh, inclination was, that we all be able to pick up a timing, uh, a time and a day that uh, work for everybody, while well, it's for almost everybody, a state by state that we have uh, uh, collaboration and participation. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, so I'd like to ask everyone to join in with us and mark on your calendars January 27th as a, a day of action and uh, where you ha would have the opportunity as a citizen leader in your community to take an action that would support the National Infrastructure Bank. So whether that's calling one of your, your elected officials, uh, trying to get an op-ed or a letter to the editor printed in your local newspaper, there are a variety of ways that, that or uh, actions that we can all take in order to raise visibility of the National Infrastructure Bank. And then I'd also uh, like to point out that um, we, we are a nonprofit organization, totally volunteer run, and we are using our resources very conservatively, and, um, but we are paying for some advertising around the country, which has been very successful. We paid for advertising in Ohio, in uh, Pennsylvania, in Delaware, in New Mexico, uh, and we've been very successful in getting uh, op-eds in newspapers in those areas also. So uh, I would like to encourage everyone to visit our website and um, make a donation if you are able. We appreciate every dollar that is donated and we, we use it to, um, to spread the word. And, um, but that kind of wraps us up except for one more thing. So don't sign off yet. Our featured speakers that we had on at the beginning of our meeting are gonna be doing a little uh, wrap up for us here. So uh, thanks again for attending everyone. And I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. The time has come for America to hear the truth about this tragic war. I've chosen to preach about the war in Vietnam today because I agree with Dante that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in a period of moral crisis maintain their neutrality. There comes a time when silence is betrayal. <laughs> 